Wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much, everyone, again, for joining, uh, taking time out of a busy build season. Um, I'm sure you're all in the thick of it. Uh, hopefully designs are done and robots almost running, I'm sure, within the next couple of days or not. But uh, uh, thanks again for taking time. We're really excited uh, about Altair um, coming on board as a, a partner with FIRST um, this year, uh, providing some amazing um, software and tools and the kit of parts for all of you all. Um, and very excited to learn um, tonight and throughout the build season, um, really how our t how their amazing software can be used to benefit our teams, uh, to each of your teams, uh, to build more reliable, more competitive robots, uh, and along with um, being able to analyze data and scouting and, and really being uh, maximizing your scouting uh, performance there as well. So um, thrilled to have uh, Jim Ryan and, and Eric Larson on the call here from Altair. Um, Jim, uh, Based out of Michigan, uh, he's been our main point of contact here uh, as we've build, been building up this Altair partnership. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jim. Uh, thanks, Jim. Thank you, Dave. And to everyone at first, it's been an amazing journey. Uh, I, on behalf of Altair, we're delighted to be partnering more closely than ever. We've worked with first teams for many years, but now it's official. As you mentioned, we are uh, suppliers in the virtual kit of parts under the software section. And that's what we're here tonight to talk about is how Altair software can be made accessible to uh, first teams and then what you can do with it and why, why you might be interested. So I hope you find this useful. Um, I provided my email address at the bottom along with my teammates, Eric Larson and Darius Spadinelli. We're all based out of our headquarters in Michigan but we do work not only nationally, you know, countrywide in the U.S., but really internationally. We are a global academic program. So we know there are many fantastic first teams in California. Um, so we're delighted to be talking with you uh, on behalf of those teams tonight or today. So primary objective here really is to help first teams know why they might want to use Altair software. You'll be the judge of whether you do or do not. Um, based on what it does and how to get started with it, which we're trying to make as easy as possible. We have a 60 minute uh, agenda tonight. It will be tight. Uh, we do encourage you to ask questions as we go, both in the chat window and we'll take breaks. But please note that uh, we're gonna try to stay afterwards at the end for anybody that can stay around with us. So we don't have to end at 60 minutes. I simply wanna try to cover all of our content in 60 minutes so that those people that were expecting to hear from us and a few guest speakers from other uh, FRC teams can hear what they wanted to hear, what they came to hear. So I'm gonna lead things off, share with you Altair's vision as a company and how that vision pertains to FIRST as an organization, why and how we provide support to FIRST teams. And by teams, I mean students and mentors. Really together, we're hoping that you learn, grow, and find useful applications for our software, which as you will see in a moment, really extends the work you're doing with CAD and then complements it by work you can do with your scouting data um, for picking alliance partners. And we are delighted to have a couple of guest speakers uh, from other teams, the Hot Team 67, the Goon Squad 3604, both from Michigan, because we work with them closely as we kind of got started with this program to make sure that our software really could be used by high school teams in a way that was helpful to building better robots faster. Their testimonials are going to be talked or be focused mostly on a product called Altair Inspire. There's another tool, as I mentioned, that's used for scouting data and making decisions, Altair Rapid Miner, data science tool. So because the students won't talk so much about that, Eric's gonna give a demo of that towards the end. Right, so let's continue. Uh, in addition to our guest speakers, Colin Lorenzo, we have, let me see if I can close this up here. We have a colleague based out of our Irvine, California office, a lot closer to you guys than we are in the Detroit metro area. Um, Keshav Sundaresh graciously agreed to work with you guys, visit your schools, have you invite you over to our office, depending on how things can work out. He will also be at the Orange County Regional Competition in Costa Mesa uh, in March. So I hope you get to see him there. Okay, so um, I always like to start off with, you know, the so what, why should you care? What's the, what's the compelling reason why our software might be useful to you guys? Well, one big reason is that teams 
are often telling us that they're, they have parts that are breaking and they want to avoid that because it might put them out of commission or at the very least, it, it sort of diminishes the, the ability the, um, to, uh, perf the, for the robot to perform as expected or intended. So in this particular case, whoops, sorry, the hot team told us they had a couple parts, uh, one in particular, this L bracket that was breaking. It broke multiple times during their competition. So they embraced the use of our Altair Inspire software for what we call topology optimization. That's a fancy way of saying we're trying to get the best possible shape to withstand the loading conditions that can happen when you bump into other robots. I know that's not intended, but that does happen, of course. And when you have jerky motions that can tend to provide high loads, and those high loads you can use with our, our software to predict exactly where your parts might break. They used Altair Inspire to show, as you can see here, they took their CAD geometry, imported it to Inspire, analyzed it using physics-driven you know, algorithms to say, yep, it's likely to break based on the loads you expect to see. And then they asked themselves, what can we do about it? Well, of course, you engineers and engineers in training, you can figure out, you can make these sections bigger. You could beef them up. Uh, you might um, even change the material type. There's You have options. But what they chose is to use our sort of intelligent software that automatically, based on a few constraints that they defined, such as where these holes for bearings need to go, uh, provided we kept those holes, we let the design space be um, changed by the computer, by the software, and it came up with this somewhat, I'd say, radically different design. Typically, these designs are organic. They look like bone structures because we're trying to remove as much, much mass as possible to lightweight our parts while not reducing the structural integrity. In the end, they were able to 3D print this part, put it on their robot, and the value to them was no breakage ever since. It was six times stronger. They were hoping to make it lighter, which often is the case, but in this case, they really beefed it up to make sure that you know, their safety factor was gonna not allow any breakage. So it's a couple ounces heavier, but that didn't you know, um, risk them exceeding their weight limit. And they could rapidly, easily, and affordably print the part with their 3D printers. And in the end, in the Michigan competition, the Milford um, FRC event, they were able to win the Engineering Inspiration Award, which was one of their goals. So they really were, I think, pretty stoked about the ability for this software to help them do what they wanted to do, optimizing their parts, trying to make it stronger, ideally a little bit lighter if possible, but certainly not much heavier. Okay, so let's back up. Who is Altair? How long have we been around? What do we do you know, with our customers in industry, engineers and data scientists who work at Boeing, Tesla, SpaceX, GM, Toyota, BMW, lots of medical device companies, companies that are trying to make the world a better, safer, more sustainable place by using our computational science. That's our vision. Help them make intelligence decisions just as you saw the hot team did moments ago really all with the ultimate goal to simulate, to innovate. In order to make the world a better place, we need to be able to do things differently to innovate and simulation plays a key role in there. So I put together a few examples that you, would help you see the kinds of simulations that are possible, computational science simulations. These are physics driven. If you look very carefully at some of these, you'll see these force vectors that are based on physics algorithms. So this isn't really like your video game per se. We're matching reality. If you were to take these systems and test them in a lab, you would find the forces at the same level that our software predicts them to be. And then based on these intelligent predictions of forces, we can tell whether parts are likely to break or whether we can lightweight them without risk of breaking. So whether you're looking to see how things move, what we call motion dynamics, you're trying to control that motion, as is the case with this military vehicle, wants to stay tracking a target, even though it goes over some rough terrain, or with a Segway-like device that Dean Kamen invented, you know, uh, it involves motion and controls, but also motors. Are the motors large enough? This helps us do some motor sizing. When you're picking and placing things that are flexible, um, and you need to place them properly. You can check to see again whether the motor sizing is correct or whether if the motor gets overwhelmed, 
it might not place properly and you have to you know choose a larger motor even though it's a little more expensive perhaps also as we talked about before light weighting is a key aspect of sustainability and energy you know efficiency so all of our commercial customers are trying to take mass out of their products cars airplanes rovers rockets etc in this case it's an off highway or construction um, equipment that is going through a digging maneuver and trying to make sure that uh, it won't break as it's digging coal or iron ore or whatever it might be. And then last but not least, this radar dish kind of combines everything. Structural analysis, the motors mo moving the dish, uh, the control system to try to make sure the, the signal gets transmitted and received properly, while adding computational fluid dynamics for aerodynamic loading and electromagnetics for the the high frequency uh, transmission of the signals. These are just representative. This is not something you guys are gonna do day in and day out, but we do wanna help you lightweight, simulate the motion of your robots, and then with Rapid Miner, pick your alliance partners, all right? All with the ultimate goal of helping you become what we call real world ready. Same sort of thing we're doing with students and universities helping them prepare to take this technology and apply it uh, in their jobs, whether it's with a company they work for or whether they company that they start. We do a lot of work with startups and entrepreneurs and love both aspects. So as I mentioned, two products to focus on tonight, Altair Inspire complements CAD for engineering simulations to do what we call functional virtual prototyping. It's going beyond the form or the fit of the parts that you look at in CAD to how they will function when you actually build your robot and operate it. And Rapid Miner for data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning for anyone, because you, it's code free and code friendly. Code free meaning you can use some drag and drop workflows uh, without having to code anything in Python or R or C++ or you know name your code, your software. But if you like to do that, you can certainly add that into Rapid Miner as sort of a foundation that you build on. So I've talked about this a little bit so far. Structural analysis to avoid breaking parts with an Inspire. Topology optimization to lightweight. Motion studies to try to get the best scoring based on how the robot's going to move around the field. And 3D printing to make your uh, part creation cost affordable and rapid you know, prototyping uh, to try new ideas quickly. So this is our part one of two. I'm going to talk about Rapid Miner in a moment. When and if you guys decide you want to try Altair technology, whether it's Inspire or Rapid Miner or both, you can go to the virtual kit of parts. Altair is now listed there. And in that area, we have a link to our website. The link is right here, which you can come back to if you need to, or you can Google search Altair First Robotics. It should show up. And on that web page, the very first thing you're going to see is go to free software. So within minutes, you can download the executable and start running it. We don't require you to wait or to get verified. We trust that you're going to use it for first and will not use it for commercial purposes, as uh, stipulated by our agreement with the first folks. On that web page as well, there are getting started materials, video tutorials built by Eric, who's on the call tonight. He's been phenomenal at trying to make this very easy for you guys to get started taking your CAD geometry, finding out will your parts bend too much? Will they break? Can you lightweight them? And will they move as desired? That's with Altair Inspire. Now with Rapid Miner, as I mentioned, it's a very good tool for data visualization, such as the data that might come from your scouting activities, in order to be able to select better alliance partners. Here's an example that came from the, the Goon Squad uh, team we're going to hear more about tonight. I won't steal too much of their thunder. In fact, what they're going to talk about is their use of Inspire. So this is a use of uh, Rapid Miner. They're using both. In this case, they looked at many different teams, the points scored during the autonomous stage of the different competitions. They narrowed it down to two just to try to make things simple here, but there's no limit to how many teams you can compare. And they decided they were the alliance leader, so they got to choose their partners. They decided to choose Team 694 because the data, Rapid Miner data science tool was able to show them very quickly 
that um, that team had performed better during several matches than the other team they were considering 36-20. And they found that it was much easier to do that than by trying to use Excel or Python alone. Last but not least, both Colin and Lorenzo, the two students that are gonna join us tonight and share their experiences, they both have also submitted their work with Alter Inspire with their first robots to our global student contest. This student, this contest is available to any students, university, pre-university, as long as you are in a degree program of some kind, and you guys certainly qualify for that, you can actually win a prize. $750 every month for the first prize, with $7,500 as our grand prize at the end of a 12-month period, the best of the best. So again, I encourage you to Google search it or use this URL, this web address at the bottom to consider sharing what you're doing. I'm sure it's going to be amazing, and we'd love to hear from you and have you show off, do some humble bragging with what you're able to accomplish. So with that in mind, as a hopeful, a good lead-in, big-picture context, let me turn things over to Eric, who's going to... Uh, play some videos for these students. It's, a, it's late night here, you know, uh, Eastern time. So they graciously agreed to let us share a pre-recorded version of what they've done. I hope you still find it useful uh, and applicable to what you guys are thinking of doing. Eric? Jim, I don't see Eric on the call. He dropped somehow. Okay. Uh, me chance I'll, you. I'll tell you what, while he's coming back, I'm hopeful that he'll come back in. Let's use the opportunity to take any questions on what I just shared. Ryan, good to see you. <laughs> Velma, nice to see you. Feel free to un un unmute and ask questions if you'd like, um, or you can post them in the chat. So it looks like we have one in the chat that says, uh, is Altair Inspire compatible with Onshape? Um, a lot of teams, uh, mine included, have migrated to Onshape, which is cloud-based. It really doesn't matter. Altair prides itself on being CAD neutral, as we call it. So we work with Onshape, SolidWorks, Autodesk, uh, Creo before Onshape, now Onshape. Um, we pride ourselves on trying to not dictate that you must use a certain tool. Use whatever you think is best in class and we'll help you work with it. Typically, we have connectors to those tools directly, but in the worst case, you can always use Parasolid, Step, and I just type, you know, CAD neutral formats. And it really is push button to bring that information into Inspire and continue on. That, that animation I showed, like the four bar linkage shifting back and forth, that was just a push button transfer from SolidWorks into Inspire and Onshape should be the same. Um, great, they, they responded and said, uh, that's delightful, thanks. Um, and then question, uh, is this meeting going to be recorded and posted? And if so, where will it be posted? Uh, yes, it is being recorded. Uh, we will be sending the recording link out to Teams uh, and then also let you know we'll have it posted uh, more than likely on our first California website. <clears throat> And if you'll permit us, Dave, we'd love to host it on the Altair site as well, but we can figure that out later. We can wait for sure. Um, also, is there any advantage uh, over, uh, over using Altair's mesh optimization versus uh, the feature in SolidWorks? That's a great question. We get that often because we know if you're using a tool like SolidWorks or Autodesk, they do have simulation capabilities um, to extend their CAD. That's a natural thing for them to do. Um, Really, it's it's like Venn diagrams. There's going to be some functionality that overlaps, in which case maybe it's easier for you to just stay in SolidWorks or Autodesk. Onshape, I think, has less what we call CAE, computer aided engineering capability, but they may focus there going forward. It really depends on the company. We feel like Altair is an engineering company. It's been our heritage for 38 plus years. We've never built CAD. We want to take the CAD and do that functional virtual prototyping. So we're always looking at how it's going to, you know, work as we load it. Is it going to overheat? Is it going to break, et cetera? So we have extremely sophisticated algorithms. The SolidWorks Autodesk world will have some, but they will not be as sophisticated. So some physics might be possible with their tools. You can try it. And if you reach a limit, then you know that you've got Altair to grow into if you'd like. Um, and it looks, well, shoot, it did. I thought Eric was here. 
Yeah, he, he was here and and um, <laughs> lost uh, again. again. Yeah, and I just want to add to Jim's comment. Uh, sorry about that. My name's Darius. I, I'm also one of the colleagues here from Altair, as Jim mentioned. For the topology optimization, you know, the FAA behind the scenes is truly converging, doing multiple analysis to get to the final, the most optimal solution. Uh, and we've been doing optimization since uh, around 1994. So it's really well tuned for that. Uh, CAD will get you an optimized product, but it won't be the optimal product, typically what we see. So uh, there's a reason why we're it's being used in designing airplanes at Boeing and Airbus and Lockheed and so forth. So because um, they're very much concerned about light weighting and strength and safety. Yeah. <laughs> Eric, do we have you back? Yeah. I don't know what's going on with my home network, but I just did a, a little uh, hotspot with my phone. Uh, so hopefully it should be stable now. I turned off my video just to keep the bandwidth as, as low as possible. Uh, but I think I'm I think I'm secure now. So <laughs> okay, good. Uh, Sorry, Dave, can you see? Are there any other questions that we should try to answer now? Or I was just someone asked for uh, the URL for the software, so maybe Jim, you could share that while we launch into the video there. I will be glad to do that. And don't forget that as a fallback, you can always go to the virtual kit of parts. It has a link over. So, but I'll put it in the chat. Thanks, Jim. Oh, Eric's getting started. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you for that great introduction, uh, Jim. That really kind of puts in in light what Altair is all about and and what we're do what we're here to help you with. But us talking about our software, you know, we work for the company. It's our software. Us talking about our software is one thing, but where the the truth of the matter, or where where we have a true testimonial, is talking to students who have, have used the, the song. And in the 2023 uh, first season, I had the tremendous pleasure and honor of working with a number of teams, but in particular, two exceptional students. Uh, one uh, is a junior on the hot team, the Heroes of Tomorrow, Team 67. And the other is actually the team captain of the Goon Squad. I think they're 3604, but don't quote me on that. Uh, and they are two very good teams out of Michigan. In fact, Hot won Michigan and went to uh, the, the World Championships, did well in that. Uh, the Goon Squad also went to World Championships, did phenomenal. In, and they are, they are two well-seasoned teams. Uh, and they had the opportunity to use our software in, in the 2023 season. And they've had some tremendous success with it. Uh, Jim kind of gave you a little bit of a preview uh, of some of that success, particularly with the hot team. Uh, but I want to give you the opportunity to hear it directly uh, out of the mouths of those who, who were using it. Uh, so we did this presentation in Michigan uh, a few weeks back, and they presented live. And with their permission, we recorded their presentations. And so as not to draw them away from, uh, from their duties uh, on first and school, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to show you that uh, video of the presentation that, that they did. Uh, and while they're not here to uh, answer questions directly, we will try our absolute best. And if there's a question that you have that can't be answered by us, but uh, could be by either Colin or Lorenzo, um, we will absolutely pass it on to them and then get that uh, get that answer back to you. So I'm going to start these videos here. Hopefully the, the audio is, is working. Uh, and then... Uh, what we'll do is at the end of Colin's video, uh, we'll have a, a brief uh, question and answer. Then I'll pop up Lorenzo's video, and we'll do that. Uh, and then we can answer more questions at the uh, at the end of the session as well. So without further ado, it is my honor to present to you Colin Dagg, a third-year student on the HOT team. Uh, so let me come here and share an advanced and... Share. Oh, okay. That was just the audio. While okay. you're doing that, Eric, let me just uh, point out that I did share the URL, the web address in the chat window for those folks that wanted to uh, visit our website and get the free software. You should be able to access it there. Okay. And now let me do this. 
So, okay, uh, Margo, can, I'm, is the I'm audio coming the through? I... Yep. Perfect. Okay. I've been on CAD for the past two years. And um, last year, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, Hot really started getting more involved with using Inspire alongside of our um, uh, like current CAD. And up until this point, we've mostly been using SOLIDWORKS. And just kind of one of the, I guess, dip, in the, uh, dip our toe in the water, as you can say, and just get familiar with Inspire. So to do that, we started looking at some key points on this year's robot that we noticed um, weren't performing up to the part that we wanted and just trying to use those as sort of case studies for Inspire to really see how it works. So um, the first thing you'll notice is that if we bring it into our main assembly over here, we have these two really critical central supports that we were using to um, hold up our main tray that we would take the game pieces, the cones and the cubes into, and then shuffle them into our arm. So these pillars down here, and being you know central parts of the robot, those had a lot of on them. And we wanted to run optimizations and analyses on those, and then see if we could make more optimized and lightweight designs that would perform better during you know high impact games. So bringing that into Inspire, we were I uh, did some experimenting with it, and the first thing you'll notice is the little red arrows up here. So when you have these initial designs, I found that we can take these and then make estimations on what kind of forces these will experience during the game. So the main one is that it has a whole robot sitting on top of it for the entire time. So you apply these sort of forces to the top of it, as well as additional shear loads, which are more sideways forces, and then use those to simulate the kind of stresses it's going to go under before you start optimizing it. So that showed us that this piece can lose a quite a bit of mass. And as you see here, after running the optimization, we went for, um, you can either choose to go with a very low mass and sacrifice a little bit more of the stiffness or go for a higher stiffness. And at the end, like uh, Jim said earlier, it's kind of that puzzle of trying to balance how much mass do I want to take out and how stiff do I want it to be. So with this one, we went for a lower mass side just to see kind of how far I could push it. And we ended up with this really sleek looking, very strong design. And it had to route an axle through it. So there was sort of this, you know, central part underneath the top where it had to have a bunch of blank space. And to make up for that, Altair gave us this very clever design that uses the routing of the forces back around that, which ended up being very, very helpful for what we were trying to do. And this, you know, this part looks pretty complicated. So we put it through a 3D printer and we're actually very finished shop. You can see here if you check my screen. Um, they weren't able to see that. Yeah, all well, this kind of stuff. And it worked very well and performed super well during matches and whatnot. So that's an excellent example of how we started to use Inspire. And then going past that, like uh, we mentioned earlier, we had one of our matches where a piece broke and we had to replace it using parts we simulated using Inspire. So um, back in our robot, if you look back here, uh, another second. Another very important part that was under a lot of loads was on our intake. So there we go. In gameplay, the Nick was a pretty, cool, uh, pretty critical piece to this. And within it, we had an L-shaped piece running along here. I was experiencing a lot of loads and since they modified it. But that piece would be taking a lot of hits. There's a lot of defense in the game last year. And we had this L-shaped printed part that we noticed was a bit suspect before our first competition. And so I went around the simulations on it and started finding that this piece would very likely break because it, the original piece just had a straight this way and then a straight that way. So to remedy that, we ran it through another optimization and went for a very high um, factor of safety of six times the strength that we wanted to have as the minimum. And lo and behold, that piece did break during one of the competitions. And had we not optimized, it would have been stranded with another weak piece to replace it with that may have ended up having us lose a competition. But we went back to our pits and quickly replaced it with this new piece. Um, and that ended up giving us a much, much more robust design that could withstand a lot of the forces that we got on to experience throughout the rest of the season. And since then, it's been extremely reliable. Uh, some more features that we, I learned about while doing this is that you can know each of the joints is going to behave when under these loads called bearing loads. And those kind of give more good distributed force to the part. And uh, not only that, but you can also apply torque loads or moments to it. And that will show how it's sort of twisting as it's being raised up and down. And this stuff obviously looks very daunting as a high school student who's starting to get into this. It's, you know, very advanced math and physics. But with the interface that Inspire provided for it, it gives a very simple um, interaction with the um, 
software and with the physics that I've only taken like a couple years of physics and I can understand this very well and understood it well last year as well. So it's a great way to start really getting into this fast. You can do these sort of simulations in just a few minutes or a couple hours if you dig into it. So moving we also on a hot team do a lot of um, industrial machining with a robot, um, more in the metal pieces. And when you're optimizing, you end up with a lot of those very organic looking shapes. So we wanted to try doing would end up manufacturing with machining. So there we go. Over here, if we look at our main arm piece, for those of you, for those of you who don't um, aluminum stock ended up. And that was obviously very heavy, especially being in the high part of the robot. And we wanted to lower our center of gravity. So we took this arm piece and just cut some squares out of it because, you know, before using Inspire, that was just kind of our instinctual response to it. We thought it would work well. But after running it through Inspire, we actually found that the ideal optimization based on the analysis we had looked a little bit more like this, which, you know, no one could really intuit very well. And it's a very much more complex design. And another thing that's very interesting note here is that on these sort of pieces on the robot, you have a lot of spaces where you don't want to be taking out mass. Like along this whole edge, we had a bunch of pieces we were bolting onto the arm. So a really cool feature they have as well is you can define design spaces, as you can see in this red here. So when you bring the arm in initially, you say, I only want to take mass out of this part. And then it does that when it optimizes it. It says, okay, I'm going to try to make this as good as possible, but not compromise your ability to attach pieces to it or utilize the space the way that you want to. And that was really, really helpful on this guy. And we still ended up with this, you'll know, hexagon pattern over here. And we noticed the design. So another great thing about Inspire is it's very compatible with the other software we've been using, um, SolidWorks, for example. So we brought this back into SolidWorks and produced a part that ended up looking more like this. So we were able to integrate both ease of machining with Inspire's optimization technology to produce this really good compromise that worked very, very well with our robot and provided much more strength and drastically um, greater strength, uh, robustness for only a very, very small increase in mass, which was super, super helpful. So just to kind of give a sense of what you'll see when you start getting into Inspire, I have a very small sample part I wanted to show you so you could just sort of see like what the process is for going through these smaller parts in the robot and starting to dip your toe in the water of how to make these designs. So over here, Yeah, so over here, I've made this bracket, and that's basically the goal of it would be if you're in a robot and you have like a 90 degree um, change in direction, I guess, and you want to be able to support it with some sort of bracket, you could make this very small bracket that are designed here, and then take that and optimize it to really reduce the mass while still keeping it as robust as possible. So going into Inspire here, is it a little bit? There we go. Yeah, so going to Inspire here, what you'll start off with, you see a lot of those optimized designs, but you're really going to begin with something that looks a little bit more like this. So there you go, a little small. Something a little more like that. So you take these corner bracket and you give it a lot more space to work with. You see I designed this red design space to be very, very large, larger than you usually expect because you want to give the software a lot to work with, even if you think it might be a bit much because you never know what it's going to produce for you. So by doing that, you can then apply some of your um, forces to it. So I had some twisting forces on the sides of it. Um, and then also forces in case that has impacts more or direct direction. And then get this out of the way. Um, let's see. There we go. So the main part that you'll be seeing with a lot of these more still parts is uh, something called the structure tab. And within that, you'll find there's lots of loads you can apply to the um, piece that you're using, and within those loads, you can create load cases, which is different situations that the um, piece is going to experience. So for example, on our intake part, and snap, we had load cases in case it was just driving around and didn't have any twisting forces on it, but still some weight. We had some cases with twisting, and a different combination of those that the simulation will run through and see how it can combine each of those cases and create a part that's um, ready to handle all of them. It can then make a, whoops, trying to deal with all the zoom interface here. There we go. It can then make the optimization. 
and that produced a piece that looks more like this. Now, that's obviously a drastic reduction in mass and looks a lot better if you want to keep a more robust design while still staying with very, very low mass. And you'll also see here that I restricted the piece as well to keep these bolt holes in it, because if you optimize away the bolt holes, that can be obviously a large compromise to your design. And out there, uh, Inspire has a lot of very good splicing tools, so you can like chunk out these parts a lot easier than I've seen in other software like SolidWorks and really get these designs going super fast without having these kind of errors that make you slap your forehead halfway through and realize you need to restart it. It's very nice. So, and then once you've got this sort of design here, you notice this is very bumpy compared to the other things. And there's a really cool function that we found for that and used in a lot of our parts called the polynerves wrap. And what that does is takes these parts and just sort of smooths them out while still keeping the integrity of it. And it looks a little more like that. And that will obviously look a lot better when you're 3D printing. And if you do anything that's machined, the machining can have a lot easier of a time trying to produce these parts using a lot of the more smoothed out geometry. So that's uh, most of what I have for our examples of how he's inspired this season. Um, moving into future uh, seasons, we plan on doing it a lot more in the larger scale and working with much more with their motion simulation. So as I mentioned earlier, we had that very large arm. And as we get better at using Inspire, we'll start to simulate our robot very early on in the process and see how it's going to behave as it's moving around in our very early brainstorming and kind of work with it as we go along. Um, it can be sort of attempting to dive into it and try to get a whole robot designed and then start optimizing it. But it's really good to integrate uh, optimization and inspire with your process as you go along with the design. And that's really what we're going to try to do as we go into the next few seasons. So if there's any questions, I think I have a couple extra minutes. I could take those. Erica. Do that. Colin, there's a question from someone, Theodore, I think it is, <laughs> that said, uh, these organic structures look pretty cool, but he's wondering how to make them and wondering if there's a particular resin that's required or is there a way to purchase these kinds of structures? Oh, yeah. So um, in a lot of the very organic ones you saw, we've been 3D printing most of those. And you can even do those in just, you know, with a Prusa and um, or an Ender and that kind of basic stuff. So, like, for example, this part looks very, very... Oh, I'm going to turn off my... Uh, turn it off. Yeah, whatever. It should be able to present. Yeah. So you see with this um, piece, you've got a very, very organic structure. It looks very complex. But if you just have your supports in right and you print it properly, you can get these designs, and they end up working just as well as you would expect to, even just using the uh, Prusa. And if you're with a more advanced printer like a Mark Forge, you can also do printing in um, SLS, and that produces amazing results as well. Um, like I said earlier, with the um, aluminum parts of the machining, you can also take that Inspire piece and then work with it to make a more um, logistically easy piece to machine uh, in your shop as well. So, looks like we have another question from Theodore. He wants to know how many hours does it take, would you say, I'm assuming, to like maybe learn the software to do what you just did? So just to start making like very basic parts, it takes almost no time. I was probably working to with print. it for... Hmm? Oh, to print. Oh, sorry, uh, to print, um, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you have a piece about this big, it'll take the same amount of time to print, whether, regardless of whether it's organic or not. That just depends on how much mass you're working with. But Looks like Theodore says they have a Prusa too, so that's awesome. <laughs> Eric, I think, I think we should pause here and take questions, if that's okay. Right. Can you... That's good. That's, that's the desired effect. Yeah, so as I mentioned in the chat, I left some of the questions in because I thought they might be beneficial to, to students here. Um, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to field them in the uh, in the chat here, or if you put them in the chat, I'll answer them personally here, or you can unmute yourself and, and ask questions, but I'd love to answer any questions, or at least attempt to answer any questions you might have based upon Colin's presentation. And Eric, are you going to be able to share your screen to do a demo, or is that going to be problematic? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that should be fine. Good. I think we should pivot to that for the folks that would like to learn more about Rapid Miner. We can always come back to Lorenzo's yeah. video later. Um, yep. Okay, so we got one question from Velma. How long did it take for you to become proficient in this software? <laughs> Excellent question, Velma. Um, define proficient, I think, <laughs> is why I'm chuckling. Um, to get started using it, um, 
with the getting started materials, the video tutorials that are on Altair's website, thanks to Eric, it could be hours to you know know all the ins and outs of it. The more you use software, the better you get at it. That's uh, just sort of the nature of things. So um, it's not like it requires a PhD dissertation to to learn this, but of course, you know, practice makes perfect, if you will. We like to think you can it can be done in in days, not you know months. I had a couple of questions that are probably related. Um, the so one, um, you know, it's it's cool that you can apply the forces, right? Different types of forces, um, and there there's got to be some kind of prediction there. And ultimately, your prediction is going to have pretty impactful results on on your results, right? So um, how difficult is that to predict, I guess, is my question, um, forces on something. And that's an excellent question, right, Dave? Because uh, we have a phrase you guys may have heard before, garbage in, garbage out. You know, So if the, the loads that you put on are not right, then the result, you know, the outputs are not going to be right. They're going to be off, you know, by a factor. Um, that's not necessarily a showstopper because sometimes engineers in industry, they've told us, they're just looking for trends. You know, if I put more load in, is there going to be a multiplier on the output or is it going to be linear? And, you know, what's the relationship? So even if it's not perfect, it can still be useful. So first and foremost, second of all, um, there is a, a good amount of engineering knowledge, you know, to say, OK, if this thing's moving at a certain rate, uh, that's going to translate into a certain force that we can anticipate. So you do have to little, do some hand calcs. Uh, they're not too... Uh, elaborate, but, you know, rather than just kind of guessing for sure, it'd be smart to try to uh, figure it out from math. Mm -hmm. But really the optimal approach, which we didn't even get to yet because it is sort of a crawl, walk, run progression. But what we're encouraging teams to do, start off simply by adding your own loads, do your best arithmetic to guess at them, see what that gives you, see if you believe it, if it makes sense. But then use our motion dynamics because the movement creates loads, you know, acceleration, you know, def, uh, F equals MA. So force is going to result from that acceleration. Uh, and those are, those loads are automatically calculated for you. That's why it's nice to have the motion dynamics and the structural analysis integrated. Right. Right. No, that makes a ton of sense, right? You can take your robot, yeah. and slam it into a wall and see what forces pop up. Right. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, in in Jim's pre, uh, preliminary presentation, there uh, he had one uh, animation. It looked like an intake lifting up and down, and there was kind of a, a wiry uh, bracket that kept changing colors. Uh, that's a, a, per a perfect example of a motion analysis leading to a structural analysis. I had no clue what the loads were on there. I did not put loads onto that when I ran that analysis. I set up the motion so that you would get that up and down lifting of that uh, that arm, made sure that the materials were correct, so the mass of that arm was correct and the movement of it was correct, and it went and calculated all the loads for me. So you don't have to necessarily know the loads if you go that. Now, one other thing worth mentioning, and then we'll get into the rapid minor uh, discussion, is uh, in a lot of cases, even in in uh, in you know uh, professional corporate level analysis they will begin to do analyses and optimizations and studies before the loads are known. If I look at a system, I can kind of get it. I mean, in, in, in students, anybody who's working in a mechanical system can kind of get an idea of the direction that the loads are going to go in. And that's actually the most important thing. The, uh, the value of the loads, we can deal with that later. If we're optimizing apart for maximum stiffness, it doesn't matter what the what the load value is. The part is going to be stiff for that load, no matter what the value is. So yes, ultimately we do have to know them accurately, but at least in the beginning portions, just having a gut feeling about it can begin that process. So, so great question, but yeah, it's 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 not a deal breaker, and it's not a showstopper if you don't know them at this particular point in time. That's super helpful. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Okay, so I I seem to be missing a little green border around my screen. Uh, is, is my screen showing here? Yes, your aircraft okay. is. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. So uh, we want to talk about rapid minor. Um, and and rapid minor is 
a data analysis tool. It's a it, it's called Rapid Miner because it's called data mining. You're, you're taking a, a bunch of information. Um, and of course, I had everything up and ready to go before uh, I had to reboot my computer. So give me just two seconds here, and I will uh, get what I wanted to show you. So um, I have a piece of data like this, or I have a bunch of data like this, and this probably looks familiar to you. It's 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 some scouting data, and it's a ton of numbers and trues and false and numbers and names and. It's, it's confusing. And I've got potentially six, 10 of those things coming in. And I have to make decisions. And I have to make decisions quickly, uh, sometimes almost instantaneously. Uh, but even with all that jumble, if I walk up to you, if you're required to make a decision, you need to decide in the next 30 seconds or a minute who you're going to choose as an alliance partner. And I hand you that. Who are you going to pick? Well, I look at this, this is my backs points contributed. These are my team numbers. I look here, wow, there's a nice big spike. It's hovering perfectly over team 3655. I'm going with team 3655, 15 seconds decision made. That's the power of data mining. Now, if you've got more than 15 seconds, there's a whole lot more mining that we can do. And that's what I'm gonna show you in the next 10 minutes or so. But this is the power of data mining. Being able to take a whole bunch of numbers, imagine you know the matrix numbers streaming down the screen, and you got to pick out the important data from that. You have to mine that nugget of data, and that's it right there. This is the number that I need. This is the decision I need, and we can do that graphically with data my, uh, rep and miner. Now, let's take a little bit of the pressure off, and now we're going to have a little bit of time here to, to talk about things. So... Jim had mentioned this is a no-code, low-code uh, software. If this is the first time you heard that, it might not make a lot of sense. There are a, a bunch of data mining softwares out there. Some of them are pretty intense and require a pretty hefty knowledge of some programming language like Python or uh, uh, I can't even think of C R. or Java or whatever. I'm sorry? R, I think, is for the oh, Python sorry. people. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's a bunch of programming knowledge you have to have to, to run these. With Rapid Miner, you can do that. If you have that programming knowledge, we absolutely can, can make use of it. But if you don't, it's as simple as doing something like this. I want to take a bunch of scouting data, and I've got that data right here. So I'm going to grab this, this, this and this, and I'm going to drag them on here. And now Rapid Miner is opening that data. There, it, it's opening it in. And now I want to take and I want to. And this, by the way, this isn't a lesson. I should have probably prefaced that. I'm not trying to teach you how to just show you the ease of which we have some awesome videos, uh, video lessons that will help you work through this. Um, but I want to append this data together. So I just come in here and I type in append and oh there it is right there and i drag this right here and i say okay i want to take that data and pop it in here 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 and now i can run this oh final connection is missing i have to put it somewhere so this is going to the output i run this and now i've taken and as easy as that i've taken all this data and i've combined it into one big form so now i be can begin to mine the whole mine and not just the individual little veins uh, but there may be some errors with this data. You know, we've got a, a mechanical file. I've got missing information right here. Well, we can solve that easily with, with Rapid Miner. I can come in here and I can uh, set up an, an edit on this. And I can say, okay, I need to cleanse this data. And I want to come over here and uh, pick this and replace missing data. And I'm going to replace it with just the word none. And I click apply and it goes through and applies it. And that's great. But now what I can do is I can take that fixing I did. I can do a whole bunch of other fixing, click add to process, and it actually creates a process within Rapid Miner to fix that. So the next time I bring in data, I can create this stream and it can be reused over and over and over again. Now, this is just simply taking four pieces of data, appending it, 
fixing it and creating a, a, a master list. But what if I then want to utilize that data? So this we'll, co we'll call this the cleaning process. So we can set up, a, we, I can make them one entire thing or I can just set up a simple cleaning process. Uh, but now I wanna move into actually utilizing that data. Now I'll show you how this is wrapping up, so we're not gonna go over that again. But what this does, this is an actual program that was created uh, by one of the teams we work with. Uh, I can't remember the name offhand. Jim can probably help me there. Um, but uh, one one of their one of their mentors uh, worked with worked with the team, and they created this to help them decide who to pick as an alliance partner. And it's going to bring in some data, and I can point that to whatever data I want. It's right now it's going to this uh, world final data, but I can continue to use this over and over again. And then it's going to begin to prepare that data. It's going to select pieces of information from it. It's going to do averaging. It's going to aggregate it. It's going to do some filtering. And when I run it, I'm going to get results from that data. And that's where that, that graph came from. It came from this, this data right here. Uh, what this is, is just the, the gross data, how much each team in the competition scored in each match and broken down into the different regions, the uh, the Auton section and the driver section. And whether we're talking about the middle score or the high score, a cone or a cube, and then points contributed. So then all I have to do is come here to visualization and I can see points contributed uh, versus the match number. But I don't want to do versus the match number. I'd rather do versus the team number. And now I can see, okay, which team gave me the most uh, the most information or most data. And then I can aggregate that. So all of the data for all the teams goes together. And now sure enough, 3655 gave me the best result. And 5895. But all it's telling me is how many, how much they contributed overall. What if I want to dig a little deeper into that? Well, I can come in here. So 3655 and 5895, I could come back to here and I can filter this. I can add that. Uh, I can say, okay, I just want to look at team 3655. And what was what's the other one? I have a good bad memory. 5895. And add that one, team number 5895. 5895 and click OK, and run this again. And now I've got filter data for just these two teams. So what I can do is come and look at the visualization. And what I want to do is not points contributed, but I want to see uh, how they did uh, in each one of the matches. So I can come here, and I can oops, uh, group by, where's the match number? There it is, match number. And then I'll come here and I'll color by team number. And now I can see, hey, 3655, which was my initial choice, the reason they had so many points is because they apparently nailed it in their first match. But then they began dwindling. And actually, 5895, though they didn't contribute quite as many points, there are more consistent point score for me. And in fact, the majority of their matches, they're getting more points than this. So now all of a sudden, my initial response of going with 3655 has changed perhaps to 5895. Or I could dig even deeper into this and I could say, I'm really interested in... Uh... Just a second here. There we go. Actually, Eric, I'm really interested. In... Uh, we're, we're, we're near the yeah. top of the hour. Okay. So I know you yep. uh, probably hard to okay. see this the clock while you're demoing. Yeah, sorry. Thanks for thanks for that. Just let me say one thing. So this is all the aggregated data for different uh, scoring zones. If I know I'm weak and scoring in the middle, I can pick somebody who's strong and scoring in the middle. Uh, or if I'm weak in the auton section, I can pick someone who's strong in the auton section. There's a whole bunch of data in there, a whole bunch of nuggets of information that you can pull out very easily with Rapid Miner. And Jim, thank you for keeping me honest with the time. So that's all I oh, wanted to perfect. say about that. Yeah, uh, no, the timing was great.
some great resources for learning how to do this. Uh, two months ago, I didn't know how to do this. I've never even opened Rep and Minor, and now I'm it's that. I won't say simple, but it's pretty easy to to, to learn. So. And what we see from our commercial customers, so you know, getting you guys real world ready, our commercial customers are telling us they want to leverage the power of data to make intelligent decisions about products they're making. So we see a convergence of data and engineering simulation, what we call engineering data science, if you will, or computational science. Uh, these, these worlds are definitely merging and will only do so more you know, going forward. So getting some exposure to this through FIRST and your STEM and STEAM areas is really valuable for you guys. So uh, we would welcome any questions people have. Uh, I know we were, had planned for an hour and we've got one more minute in that uh, and we don't want to keep you longer than, than necessary. But uh, Jim, myself, Darius, uh, we're all willing to hang on for a while afterwards if people want to ask questions. Uh, so I see a hand raised. Uh, Patty, if, if you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask, I'd love to love to hear your question. Yeah, I have a question about data miner. This is Patty from a team in San Diego, California. So um, it looked like the data miner program was an application on a PC. For my students who will be scouting, um, two questions. Can scanning data be obtained in any manner that they want to obtain digitally? And then secondly, does the host machine that's going to be running data miner have to download an application or is it a web app? And can it be a, a phone? Uh, so first and foremost, the data that you saw, that actual data, uh, my my understanding, talking to to the gentleman who was setting this up, was there was a uh, a uh, phone app or a tablet app that some team had put out there, and apparently that happens frequently every year, where somebody will put a, an app out there, and so they just load it on their tablets, and that app had the ability to export the data in a CSV file, and so. Uh, that was all downloaded from tablets, had nothing to do with Rapid Miner. That was a, a third party app that some other team had written. And then they downloaded the CSV data, and uh, Rapid Miner then uh, absorbs that CSV data in and converts it to its own format. So, however you want to do that, comma delimited, comma separated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, our team. Yes, that's very well, very common. Like you said, teams, yep. um, the, whatever, everybody shares and um, yep. how they get. The, but the who the machine that has to hold the. Yes, that's what that's what I was just about to mention. Uh, so this is running on my PC. We do not. We do not at the moment, at least unless something's changed. We do not have a web app for this. It runs locally on the machine. I know it runs on PC. I. Uh, Hopefully Darius or Jim know if we have it on like a Mac or uh, or other uh, other uh, formats, but this is something that you would run on your own on your own machine. It, it's uh, currently Windows native, so you okay. know if you're Mac, of course you can run the emulator to. Most of the kids have um, all the kids have access to Chromebooks for our tiny little school district, um, and then secondary PCs. Um, cool. Um, Great. Thank you. This looks really fun. Awesome. Great question. Appreciate it. Uh, so anybody else? And we'll kind of also monitor the the chat here if, if somebody just wants to put it in there. Um, I had a question. Um, I'm from yeah. Team 4159. And I was wondering, do you have um, a documentation on how to nav navigate like your simulations and everything? Just if you want to use it later? Yeah, great, uh, great question, and it's something we kind of briefly touched on. And Jim did put the uh, put the link in there. But while I'm answering questions here, let me uh, share my screen again, and uh, just come to here, and we'll go to uh, all air support first. I do this because just to show you how easy it is to to find it, uh, all air support for first robotics. Uh, and this can also, this link is also the same that's in the kit parts, uh, no no different. Uh, but if you scroll down here, first of all, 
This is where you can get our software, Inspire and Rapid Minor, plus another software uh, we haven't addressed called Compose. Uh, but then also, we've got a, we uh, we together a total of eight modules, uh, six of them dealing with Inspire, uh, different aspects of Inspire, so structural analysis, optimization, uh, motion analysis. Uh, and then we have two of them with Rapid Minor. And all you have to do, there's no, there's no paywall or uh, password wall or registration wall or anything like that. Just click and download the module. It's going to have all the files that you need to either do the Inspire or the Rapid Minor uh, study. There's going to be a uh, uh, instructions and a how-to video that will quickly walk you through there. Plus, we've included uh, for each one uh, the end result. So you've got the starting, but then we also include the end, so you can open that up and just kind of reverse engineer it. So however, whatever you want to do, it's it's all right there. Uh, this is the best place to start. And then if you have further uh, needs, contact us, and we can point you to a tremendous amount of other online information. Uh, but this is where you're going to want to where you're going to want to start, and then we can help you from there. And go down to the very okay, bottom. Okay, perfect. Bit, Thank you, Eric. Yeah, thank you for that question, Maria. It was great. If you can scroll down, Eric, there's our online discussion forum. So, oh yes, thank you, thank you, you thank ask you. Us questions, and you know, it gives us the ability to bring all our experts from around the world when they have time, and even other first teams if they've got expertise, like Colin and Lorenzo, they might answer your questions there. So feel free to, uh, similar to Chief Delphi, if you've used that forum, only it's not just for. Um, um, well, it's it's for Altair's version of first, so to speak. It's, a, it's for questions focused on Altair software. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this form right here, um, we are monitoring it. Uh, other uh, other people in first are monitoring it, uh, and we'll we'll happy to answer your question there. <laughs> the big advantage to using this is that it becomes resource that others can search as well, kind of like uh, Chief Delphi in that regard. So. Anyone else? Please don't be shy. It looks uh, like uh, Lakshia. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I had a question about the design simu the it's not sorry the motion simulations and all that. So when 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 you like actually like or for example for the intake example, um, would you be able to like simulate like the motors like putting voltage into the motors or do you just uh specify a starting and an ending point of the rotation, or how exactly? Yeah, that's a great question. question. Uh, yeah, when what you so that that's actually one of the powers of of Inspire um, is there are four different ways that you can define uh, a motor, uh, and however you define that motor, that kind of becomes the driving force. It will achieve that no matter what. So, for instance, say you know that you need that motor to turn 180 degrees. So you can set it as an angle driven motor and you say this will turn 180 degrees in so many seconds. And if it takes uh, one Newton meter of force or a billion Newton meters of force, it will turn 180 degrees. But I can then go and query that motor and it will tell me how much torque was required to turn that 180 degrees. On the other hand, let's say you've got a specific torque rated motor and you want to know if it's going to work to lift your, your intake. You put it in there, you make it a torque-driven motor, you put the torque value on there and say, I want to apply this amount of torque for 10 seconds, and if it can lift it, it will. If it can't, it will struggle and it will stop and it will not move. So it is representing physics. So while you're not applying electricity to it, you are defining either an angle, a torque, a speed, or an acceleration. Those are the four ways you can do it. And then we also have what are called actuators, which provide linear motion. And you can do similar things with that distance, uh, force, uh, speed, and acceleration. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Um, but sorry. Uh, one thing I, so for our, for Falcon motors or for motors in general, like the torque is generally re related to the speed. Uh, is that also mirrored or is it just a constant torque? That's, well, I won't say it's a constant torque. It's actually, you can define that torque behavior. So you can, if you just leave it on its own, it will create a smooth curve up to 
the maximum torque and then a smooth curve down. Uh, we do that automatically, put a smooth controller on it just to, so you don't get jerkiness out of it. But you can define your own uh, torque behavior. So even, you know, if you were, and we've had customers do this, they'll put that motor onto some sort of sensor and pull a torque versus speed value uh, off of that or a torque versus time value off of that and then just bring that in as a CSV and have that drive the, the torque. So what I described was just the simplistic put a value in, but we can get very complex and have it curve or equation driven uh, as well. So. All right, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. We know how much, you know, is motor driven on your robot. So Lakshya, thank you yeah. for asking that. It's an excellent question. As Eric said, most of all, the inputs in Inspire are going to be torques. If you want to understand better the relationship between, you know, current and voltage and things like that, more electrical engineering oriented, we have other software that you can also get for free, but that would typically then re require a deeper dive into the electrical engineering which then maybe becomes an output as an input to the Inspire tool. We try to keep things simple by just focusing on Inspire, but if you want to get more complicated, we can help you. Absolutely. So happy to address any other questions. It looks like we're down to the, the select dedicated few now. Awesome. Well, I think the forum is going to be very helpful for teams to continue to ask questions along the way. I think there's a lot of information. I know for me, <laughs> um, this is like, oh my gosh, this looks amazing. Uh, but really diving in and getting uh, getting uh, getting hands on with the with the programs. You know, I'm sure there's going to be questions that come up. So it's nice to know that folks can jump on those forums and there's lots of lots of people that'll be able to support along the way there too. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and if we, we don't have our university teams using our software on things like solar car challenges, we typically have periodic sessions with them throughout the year. If they're new, you know, freshmen, and sophomore, uh, they can kind of get started with us. So we could certainly do that sort of thing with the, the teams that were involved here tonight and more. If you'd like, Dave and, and Becca and Deb, uh, we'll look for your guidance to see if you think that's useful or sure. open. Absolutely. That's great. Excellent. And if there's no more questions, I just want to say thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, we appreciate you taking time from your busy schedule to, to, to listen to us. We're here to help you. Uh, you know, we, we love our software, uh, but we've seen, we've seen tremendous success with an, with a number of teams and, and a number of people, as Colin mentioned, who, you know, a month prior to that hadn't ever touched it. And then all of a sudden he's designing parts to save their robot in competition. Uh, so we're here to help you, but very much appreciate your time and uh, look forward to working with you. And uh, everyone, uh, have a fantastic season. Uh, the uh, the I you know, watched the, the kickoff. It looks like an awesome competition this year. Uh, but thank you all for joining us. Go 49ers. <laughs> Go Lions. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much, Jim, Eric, and Darius uh, for uh, jumping on tonight and sharing. Um, certainly a huge thank you to Altair for um, sharing your software with our teams. Um, we're just excited as you are to see how our teams use it and um, and what, what great successes they have with it. So um, good luck to everyone. Uh, thanks, thanks again for uh, putting this on for us, and uh, we'll definitely be in touch. Thank Sounds you. Good. Have yep. a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.